Okay, Tom, if I said to you that I'm reminding you of the words written before by our founding fathers, which guarantee us the right of freely assembling to worship God however we choose, and to freely have firearms to defend these God-given rights, and that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people, then all you would have to do is to search out and locate where our founding fathers stated those words. And you would know straight away that what I have just brought to your mind is the entire context of the Bill of Rights. Why? Because that's where those words written before by our founding fathers can be found, right? So you see, it wouldn't be necessary for me to specifically say to you, Hey, Tom, I'm citing from the Bill of Rights now, would it? You see, you would know immediately that I was referring to the Bill of Rights because of those key elements that I cited from those words written before by our founding fathers and that I brought the entire context of the Bill of Rights into your mind. Okay, this is what Peter does in 2 Peter 3 and verse verses 1 and 2. Notice this, Tom. Right here, the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which in both, notice that both, that's his first epistle and his second epistle, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Do you see that, Tom? And of the commandment of us, the apostles, and of the Lord and Savior. All right. See that right there, Tom, okay? Peter is reminding his audience, and that's, uh, let's, let's look at this here. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and so on, okay? Those are the pilgrims of the dispersion. Same people that James is writing to, in James, and that's, that's stated in James 1 and verse 1. All right, now, let me go back here. <clears throat> uh, all right, now, you were doubting and you were contesting that Peter was citing from the Song of Moses. All right, now watch this, Tom. In chapter 2, Verse 1, he says, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, notice, even denying the Lord that bought them. Tom, this is taken right out of the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 6. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Do you see that, Tom? Peter reminding his audience of the words spoken before by the holy prophets and all and, and he brings this into their mind just like I brought to your mind the words written before by our founding fathers in the Bill of Rights. Peter is bringing to these Hebrew Christians' minds the context of the Song of Moses by citing from the Song of Moses. Even that these false teachers, these are those Judaic teachers who were denying the Lord, denying the Lord that bought them. He says, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is an echo of Deuteronomy 28 and verse 20, where it says, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thy hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly. See that? All right. Now, he goes on and says, he says, uh, you know, God spared not the angels of sin. He spared not the old world. All right. But now let's, let's skip on down here. Now look at verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. All right. Now, let's keep going. Notice here in verse 12, these, that's those false teachers that he just mentioned, as natural root beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, they shall and, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime. Now notice, spots they are and blemishes. Do you see that? That is taken from Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. 
See, earlier he quoted from verse 6. Here he's quoting from verse 5. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you see that, Tom? That is, is even what Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when he said, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. He's referring and citing from the Song of Moses right here, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5. And Jude says the same thing in Jude 1 verses 12 through 15. You can pause the video. You can read those verses right there. These are spots in your feasts of charity, okay? All right. So, now let's come to chapter 3. Again, he is reminding them of the words spoken before by the holy prophets. And he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Now look, watch this, Tom. Jude says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Do you see that? That is exactly what Peter says here in verse 3. And these scoffers, and this was another thing that you... Uh, you balked on this, and you said that scoffers was not mentioned in Jude. Well, yes, they are. Right here, verses 17 and 18, where Jude says, But, beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before, notice that, Jude writing, and he says, These words have already been spoken to you. These words spoken before of the apostles, of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there should be mockers, that's the same word in the original, Tom. Even though the King James has scoffers in, in verse 3 of 2 Peter here and mockers in Jude. It's the same word in the original language, Tom. And Jude here says how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. That is a verbatim quote of what Peter says right here there shall come in the last days scoffers, mockers, walking after their own lusts. Jude is quoting Peter. And that's why I showed you that Jude specifies the judgment of the body of Moses. Okay? All right. Let's go on. And saying, where is the promise of his parousia? Tom, this is the parousia right here. Now let me show you. Go to the to the Greek here, the promise of his coming. Right here, see that? That's the parousia, okay? And that is the parousia because there's only one. Parousia is a singular noun. It is always singular. There was only one parousia of the Son of Man foretold to come. Jesus, that's what he's talking about. That's what the disciples asked him about in the Olivet Discourse. They came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of the parousia? You see that? And of the end of the age. Now, you've already admitted to me that the word world there, a heon in the Greek, is age. You've already admitted that to me. That it's not talking about the end of the cosmos, not talking about the end of material creation there. That is the end of the Jewish age. You have admitted that to me, Tom. Okay. And they were asking him about his parousia. And Jesus is talking about his parousia down through the Olivet Discourse. He mentions it again in verse 27. He mentions it again twice in verses 37 and 39 in the analogy of Noah and the flood. This is after verse 36, Tom. He's still talking about the parousia. And it is the parousia that James said has drawn near. It is at hand. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Okay. All right, now. And notice here it says, for this they, that's the scoffers, they willingly are. That's present tense, Tom. Some of these scoffers were already present. They were already scoffing at this. Okay? That's present tense. Are. They are ignorant of these things. Let's go on. Now, he says here, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store. Do you see that, Tom? That is taken directly from Deuteronomy 32, verses 34 and 35. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of the calamity is at hand, and the things that come upon them make haste. Do you see that, Tom? This is the day of vengeance. 
that was going to come upon Israel in Israel's last days. That's what the Song of Moses is about. All right. And that's what he says here, that these things are kept in store. He's quoting, citing, echoing from the Song of Moses, reminding his audience of the words spoken before by the holy prophets. And then he says in verse 10, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. I know you know that passage. You know this clearly because your favorite part of this chapter is verses 10, 11, and 12. Okay? That is the futurist's uh, pretext that they rip out of context. But notice, please notice this. Let's, let's look at this. And please remember that, uh, and I know you know this, that Peter goes on and says, referring to the Apostle Paul, right here in verse 15, he says that in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Do you see that? Paul, in all his epistles, wrote of these things. That would be the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night and the elements melting and all the things that Peter talks about here. Paul wrote of these things also. That means Paul's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night is Peter's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. And that's what he says right here. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and he said, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now again, Paul's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night is Peter's day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. They're synonymous, and I, I believe you can understand and you agree with that. But notice here what, what Paul says. For when they shall say peace and say they. Who's the they there, Tom? Study that. Those, that is the recalcitrant Jews that were persecuting the Thessalonians. That is the they. Okay? They. When they shall say peace and safety, then, now notice, then sudden destruction comes on them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now notice, Tom, but you Brethren, are not in darkness that that day, what day? That day the Lord coming like a thief in the night. Verse 2. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Do you see that, Tom? Paul is telling the Thessalonians because they know perfectly of the times and seasons of the parousia of the Lord coming in the clouds of heaven. Chapter 4, he's just said that in chapter 4. Because they know perfectly the times and seasons of the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night, then they would not be overtaken like a thief in the night. In other words, they would escape. While their Jewish countrymen, the persecutors, they would be destroyed because they are not watching. They are disobedient. Okay? Now again, notice in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, Where Watch ye therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. That's the same thing he said in verse 36. No man knows the day or the hour, right? But notice now, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known at what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. You see that, Tom? Again, that's the same thing he said in verse 36. And before verse 36, he's talking about the parousia. After verse 36, that I've just showed you, in verses 37 through 39, he's still talking about the parousia. Then in verse 42, he says, Watch ye therefore, because you don't know what hour your Lord does come. That's what he said in verse 36. He's still talking about the same thing. And then in verse 43, he's talking about, and he uses the motif of the thief coming in the night. Okay, And, and watch, he says, because you don't know what hour that the Son of Man is going to come. But then Paul wrote, to, later on, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and told them that they did know the times and the seasons and that they would not be overtaken like a thief. Now, back to verse 10. The heavens pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Do you see that, Tom? That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And you admitted that is not an end of time prophecy. You admitted that, Tom. You're right. You're right. We agree on that. This is not an end of time prophecy. 
but Peter is quoting, citing, echoing, drawing from the words spoken before by the holy prophets. Just like I referred you to the words written before by our founding fathers and quoted and echoed from the Bill of Rights. Do you see that, Tom? Peter is citing and drawing his language from the Song of Moses, among other texts, but from the Song of Moses. And right here, the verse that you admitted correctly is not an end-of-time prophecy. Peter cites this prophecy, this text, from the Song of Moses and applies it right here to the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. Got the gig's up, Tom. It's over with. Your admission refutes your position at least on this text. You'll have to go somewhere else in the Bible to try to prove the end of time. You cannot prove it from this text right here based on your own admission. All right. Um, let's look at verse 12. I want to hit one thing real quick right here. Notice, that, that it, notice this color coding right here, this color shading that I've added here. This kind of a green, funky green. Uh, the elements shall melt. That's from the little Greek word luo. Okay. And right here shall be dissolved. That also is from the same word, the little Greek word luo. Here it is in future tense. Right here it is in future tense. But guess what, Tom? Right here is the same word, but it's in the present tense. And I'm going to prove that to you. When we go right here, this is Bible Hub. You can go here. You're probably familiar with this. This is a very good tool. 2 Peter 3, verse 11. See right here? These things in this way all being dissolved. Do you see that, Tom? Do you see that right there? Present participle. Do you see that? That is in the present tense. Okay? Now, what Peter is simply saying is these things are being dissolved and he's looking for the, the completion of it. He says they're going to melt. They're in the process of, of being dissolved. And they're going to be dissolved. Peter is looking for the completion of what is already underway right here. This is present tense language. Okay? And I just showed that to you. All right. Now, he says, nevertheless, according to his promise. Do you see that? That's what the scoffers were scoffing about. They were saying, where is the promise of his parousia? Right? And Peter said, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Tom, Peter is drawing this specifically from Isaiah 65, where the prophet said, You shall leave your name for a curse to my chosen, and the Lord God shall slay thee. That's the judgment of old covenant Israel. That's the slaying of Judah. Okay? The Lord God shall slay thee, call his servants by another name. Do you see that? For, now notice verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, heavens and earth, and that's what Peter is looking to be dissolved. For, and he says, uh, The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but be ye glad and rejoice forever uh, in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people a joy, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Now notice, Tom, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. That's resurrection, Tom. And I can prove that. I'll do it in a different video to try to keep this one short. Okay? That's resurrection at the time of the new creation. Peter is quoting Isaiah 65 according to his promise, prophecy, looking for, anticipating, eagerly anticipating the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's that world of righteousness that Daniel foretold in Daniel 9 that is in the, the countdown of the 70 weeks. The, this world of righteousness right here. Now, also, we see this again in Isaiah 66 where uh, Isaiah is still talking about the new heavens and the new earth, which is down below. It goes off the screen at the bottom here. That I couldn't get all that footnote in there, but go over there and read that. Isaiah 66. Go there and read that. Read both chapters. Read them carefully. Okay? I'm just looking at a few things to show them to you here. All right, in verse 14, When you see this, your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like an herb, the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. Tom, that's Second Thessalonians chapter 1 right there. Okay? For behold, the Lord will come with fire, 
and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Now notice, for by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Tom, that's Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul quotes verbatim from verse 15 right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, telling the Thessalonian Christians, the brethren there, that they are going to receive relief from their persecution when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire. And he's quoting that right here from Isaiah 66 and verse 15, verbatim. Now notice, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the mouse, shall be consumed together, saith the Lord, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Now watch this, Tom. And I will set a sign among them. And I, Now notice, Tom, watch this, verse 19. I will send those that escape of them unto them. Let's just go there. Look at this, Tom. For by fire and by sword, and right here, verse 15, this is where Apostle Paul is quoting in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 8. Okay? Verse 8 there. All right? Verse 7 and 8. He's quoting from verse 15. All right. Now notice this. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them to the nations. Do you see that, Tom? Do you see that? Look at that. Isaiah said there's going to be some that would escape this day of the Lord coming in flaming fire. Do you see that? Look at that right there, Tom. Read that. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them to the nations, to Tarsh, Pul, Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal, Javon, and the isles afar off that have not heard of my fame, neither seen my glory. They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Do you see that? And right here, he's going to, again, he's going to create the new heavens and the new earth. Right here. That's what he said in the previous chapter. Okay? He's elaborating in chapter 66 on what he said in chapter 65. All right? But he's going to send those that escape. Do you see that? And see, Paul had already, and as I said, he quotes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from this text right here, verbatim. And he'd already written to them and told them that they were going to escape the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. You see that, Tom? These passages are much too plain uh, to ignore. All right, now, in light of this exegesis, which I have just demonstrated to you, merely pointing at what these texts say, and that Peter is referring his audience to the Song of Moses, and these prophetic texts here in Isaiah 65 and 66, texts which specifically mentions the new heavens and the new earth, which specifies that some would escape the day of the Lord coming in flaming fire, again, which Paul quotes verbatim, telling the Thessalonian Christians, telling them that they would escape the day of the Lord coming, uh, the, the coming like a thief in the night, and that they would receive relief from their persecution when the Lord Jesus would be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. And again, he just told them that they would escape this day of the Lord coming in flaming fire. Now, now you can scoff at these things. You can shrug your shoulders and just walk on. But you cannot disprove what I have just demonstrated to you from these scriptures, which you have just read with your own eyes. Okay? Peter is not predicting the end of material creation because that is not in the context. Peter is reminding his audience of the things written before, spoken before, by the holy prophets. Now, if those things spoken before by the holy prophets had foretold the end of time, then by your paradigm that the law was nailed to the cross, we wouldn't be here now, would we? Now, think about that. Let that soak in, Tom. If it's foretold in the Old Testament, that material creation was going to be dis destroyed and come to an end, then that would have happened in the first century by your paradigm, by your own admission that the law was nailed to the cross. Okay? You see, e either way you go, you're in a huge self-contradiction. Okay? All right. But anyway, I've, I've took all, a lot of your time, and I do appreciate you watching these videos. I really do. I really appreciate that. And I just I hope you'll go back and watch them again. Okay? Slow down. Stop the video, pause, look these scriptures up, open your Bible, look them up, read, read above and below, get you an interlinear, get Strong's, 
a concordance, whatever you need. Look these words up. Study, Tom. Study these things with an open heart. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to help you see the truth on these things. Okay? That's all I want to do. That, and, and I've been coming to this for a long time. And I, I studied my way to the point of realized eschatology through my own personal studies. Okay? That's where an honest investigation will lead anybody. You have to have help, and, and we've had plenty of help through the decades to misunderstand these things because we didn't study the Old Testament. Okay? The Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament coming to fruition. Okay? All right, again, thank you, thank you, Tom, for your time. And please study these things. And love you, brother. Please keep studying these thoughts, okay? All right, talk to you later.